studies and wired words and a lot of different things that you can get involved in we also encourage you to do Bible studies anywhere you can it doesn't have to be sponsored by the gathering but get into the word and uh, do some studying for your heart and soul that's the main thing um, as far as Great America trip do we have anything set up uh, for the youth yet the 22nd okay that's the day that I have off at marriages galore this August that's a good thing but on the 22nd, we're going to shoot for that. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. So any youth or youths, you know, are welcome to come from high school through uh, college. So it's all free. We pay for the admission, the parking, and uh, one meal. Uh, so anything else uh, you want to spend money on, you have to bring yourself. Anything else that we have as announcements that you're aware of? Just as a side note, um, I am going with my family to the Renaissance Fair the last Saturday of this month. If you're interested in going and just want to meet up with friends and have a good time, it is not sponsored by the gathering. No. <laughs> but a lot of us went up last year and had a really good time. So That would be on the 29th. Yes. So I keep uh, Ray Beebe in your prayers. He's doing well with the stem cell. Also, some of you may be aware that uh, uh, Cindy Stiver had pancreatitis, so keep her in your prayers as well. Uh, any other prayer requests that we have uh, uh, that you know, we may not be aware of? So, okay. We have a visitor from the hotel. Lynn, you want to raise your hand? Yeah. 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 Welcome. So make sure you say hi to Lynn during uh, the passing of the peace. Okay? That's about it. Thanks. It's summertime, so we come here. I didn't know both. I didn't know both were open. Good morning, please stand. We begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, let us worship our God. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one parent of all who is above all, and through all, and in all. We come, we come with humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love. Please remain standing for the opening song.
together. This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and then he appeared first to the women, and then to Peter, and then to twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. The first lesson is from Exodus 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you, will, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he was heard, because, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord, for what we are, that you complain against us. And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from the fourth chapter of Ephesians. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with the humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us came to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine by people's trickery by their craftiness and deceitful scheming but speaking the truth in love we must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it what which it is equipped as each part is working properly promotes the body's <coughs> growth in building itself up in love here ends the reading please stand for the gospel the holy gospel according to uh, the gospel of john chapter 6. now the next day the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there they also saw that jesus had not got into the boat with his disciples but that his disciples had gone away alone and then some of the boats from tiberius came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the lord had given thanks so when the crowd saw that neither jesus nor his disciples were there they themselves got into the boats and went to capernaum looking for jesus and when they found him on the other side of the sea they said to him rabbi when did you come here and Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are not looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who has sent, in him whom, whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from the heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Please be seated. Well, as you will know, it's been an interesting couple of weeks for me. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, officiating at my daughter's wedding. That was cool. And it was a great wedding, a great reception, good time by all. And I give my daughter uh, a thumbs up for planning a great wedding. But, uh, you know, I had the privilege of walking her down the aisle and then officiating at the wedding. And so not too many people have that privilege. And so as one person said, well, you became, you, you, you went from Father Dawson to Pastor Dawson, and, and as I said at the wedding, no, 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 Father Dawson's a little too Catholic for me, you know. I, I would prefer, you know, Father of the of Diana Dawson, who uh, turned around and became uh, Pastor Dawson, you might say. And what was cool about it is that uh, as I finished walking her down, I went to this little side room, because I had my tux on and I put my vestments on and my stole, which I haven't worn for a while, but I think that was a great touch that my my daughter wanted me to do so things went well and what happened is uh, as soon as the wedding was done I had one day to get ready to go on my Canadian trip as you well know every summer I go to Canada and I do some fishing up there and it was a great trip it was a seven day trip we had seven days of fishing and uh, it was uh, Ted Gibbons and Gary Johnson and uh, Bill Schneider some of you might remember Bill Schneider he was uh, he's a brother of, of Carol Allen Carol Allen, who passed away not too long ago. Uh, so we had a great time. And we fished totally different. You know, most people who go to Canada, uh, they just jig for walleyes. They spend all day going up and down in the boat, and, you know, with little worms and leeches. I'm serious, this is what they do. <laughs> and half the time they're drunk, you know, but that's what they're doing. 
but we go to Canada and we work. We we uh, you know we troll all the, uh, the shorelines. We we cast all the bays. We really work at it, and we use all synthetic bait. So we're not catching walleyes at the end of a thing. We actually work for our fish, and so you know we may catch uh, up to 20 fish per person per day. So when you look at that, you know we probably caught anywhere between five and 600 fish total as a group for that whole week. So I find that to be quite commendable when you think about it, and that's the way we like to fish. Uh, so the first two days uh, I spent with Ted in the boat, and then the next two days I spent with Billy in the boat, and the next two days I spent with Gary, uh, and Gary and I are like brothers. It's definitely a love-hate relationship, but we managed to survive those two days. And the last day, which was Sunday, uh, Ted and I were back together in the boat together. <laughs> and uh, we wanted to make it a great fishing day, that last day, which was this past Sunday. And so we did. We wanted to catch our, our, our 20 fish. And, and, uh, and, and we did. We used all, we pulled no stops. We, we casted, we trolled, we did everything. And we actually had four doubles that day. A double is when you catch fish both at the same time. How cool is that? And we had three doubles in one bay. Remember that? That was pretty cool. So it was an exciting day, and we ended on our 40th fish just in time. And, um, well, we both caught our 20. Well, maybe I caught 19 and he caught 21, but who's counting? <laughs> um, but we caught our 40. And, uh, and he says, why do you want to end on 40? I said, well, it's a great biblical number. 40 is a, is a biblical number. You have Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days, and you've got uh, you know, God's chosen people who have been just liberated from bondage from Egypt going through you know, the wilderness for 40 years. So I said, it's a great number to end on. We caught 40 fish and let it be. So that whole number 40 is what leads us right into that text that Cheryl just read from the book of Exodus which is the beginning of that 40-year journey of God's chosen people in the wilderness. You know, we were in the wilderness of Canada. Well, that's a lot different than the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula, which is all rocks and, and desert and not a very nice place to be. And so they're starting to grumble a little bit, you know? They're wondering if they're going to die of hunger out there in the middle of this wilderness, and wouldn't you? You know, and they're starting to say, well, you know, uh, yeah, even though it wasn't uh, very pleasant as slaves under Pharaoh, at least we had three, three hots and a cot. You know, as they say, we had some meals and a place to, to sleep. And they're complaining, and they're actually, they're actually accusing God, maybe, of, of bringing them out there to, to get rid of them. But lo and behold, amazingly, God does not get all upset at their accusations, and they're accusing him of possible trickery. Instead, he's very gracious as you read this text from Exodus. He actually says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide food for my people. Uh, I'm going to make sure that they never go hungry again. I will give them quail at night and this frosty stuff on the morning, which they'll gather, which will be like bread-like substance called manna. And so they'll have their meat and their bread. And that's how God fed his people for 40 years. And I don't think there was a complaint after that. But uh, what's fascinating about this whole thing is that the whole concept of manna, God blessing his people so graciously, is actually enfleshed in Jesus. Jesus makes it very clear in our gospel lesson that he is the bread from heaven, the true manna that came into this world, not only to feed people physically, their bellies, but now to also feed them spiritually. He adds that dimension in our gospel. Yes, in the days of old, God fed you physically and your bellies were full, but I come to you not only to feed you physically in the feeding of the 5,000, which just took place right before our lesson for today, but I also come to feed you spiritually, to feed your soul. I come not only to feed your belly, but to feed your soul. I provide a heavenly manna. 
in addition to five loaves and two fish, I come with a heavenly manna, heavenly food, to touch the very essence of who you are internally. And for me, that's what the soul is. We all know what the belly is, you know, the physical aspects, that's the old nature that craves physical things and physical gratification. But for me, the soul is the new nature, that inner sanctum, that essence of life that is there at the beginning when you're born and lives with you eternally forever. Your fleshy self may die, but that soul lives on forever. That's the new nature. That's what you and I are called to work on every day is the very inner sanctum of our lives. The problem is we live in a country where there's a lot of stuff for the belly. <laughs> yep, we do. We live in a country where, that has an overabundance of food. We throw a lot of it away and we can all stand to lose a few pounds, isn't that right? Myself included. We have an overabundance of belly stuff. And that's good. We should thank God every day that we have such a tremendous amount of food bestowed upon us. Really, we should thank God every day that we, when was the last time you actually went hungry? Now, I'm not talking about when you were a teenager and you came home and went, I'm starving, which, you know, but when was the last time you actually experienced the pangs of hunger? I, I don't recall that. So that's how blessed we are, not only in food substance, but materially. Folks, we have a lot of stuff in this country. In fact, I read an article about a Chinese laborer who works in China uh, in a manufacturing plant that manufactures plastic items destined for the United States. And this guy's been working there for the last 10 years, and he says he can't believe all the plastic items we as Americans spend our money on. He calls them trinkets for our kitchens and our homes and our bathrooms and our cars. All these plastic things stuff, well he had another word for it, but stuff, <laughs> he can't, but again, that's how blessed we are, but yet at the same time, all that Billy stuff sometimes gets in the way of what's good for the soul. My daughter just came back from St. Lucia, which is where she bought me this, I just put it on, isn't that cool? two bottles of hot sauce the <laughs> but she said once you're off the resort it's a whole different ball game I've heard people that have gone to Mexico once you get off the beautiful Americanized resort people are living in little shacks God bless them but that's the way they live beautiful island great uh, weather but you know it, we don't realize how blessed we are, but yet in some ways that's also our curse because all that belly stuff can sometimes get in the way of what's really important. When I did my mission trips to Myanmar, which is modern day Burma, definitely third world folks, these people had nothing, but yet they longed for the spiritual manna of Jesus in a way that I very rarely see in this country. They hungered for the manna of Jesus, for their inner sanctums, because they had nothing else to distract them. So that's kind of the blessing and curse thing. But we're also blessed in this country that we have the freedom to pursue what our soul desperately needs from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have the freedom to pursue in any way that God sees fit without fear and intimidation, anything that can change our inner sanctum in a way that God sees fit, that new nature, whether it be uh, prayer and devotional life, whether it be worshiping God and praising him in ways that he sees fit at a musical concert, 
whether it's uh, fellowshipping with believers or being mentored or mentoring somebody else as disciples, uh, whether it's a uh, Bible study or, or, or a book study about Jesus or how him, we are so blessed that we can do this openly and freely in this country. That's our blessing. And we need to take advantage of that. God is not so concerned about this. He's more concerned about what's going on in here. This is what binds us together. All of us have that in common, that we all need to be fed by what Christ has to offer in here. And we all need to be in constant change. Nobody can say, I've arrived when it comes to my inner sanctum. That's a process that ends the day you die physically and that inner sanctum is lifted up eternally to Christ. It's a never ending process. Nobody can say that they've arrived. And so in my daily life, I'm always looking for things to help change and impact my inner sanctum in whatever little ways that God sees fit. And I'm hoping you can do the same. Uh, before I left for Canada, we were studying uh, this book, A Day with a Perfect Stranger. Some of you were part of that study. And I'd just like to read what's on the back here. Exasperated by her husband's sudden new obsession with Jesus, because this was written after the, a, a dinner with a perfect stranger. This is the wife of the man who went for a dinner with a perfect stranger. Her name is Maddie. Maddie Kaminsky views an out-of-town business trip as a welcome opportunity to reflect on her marriage and to decide if it's time to put an end to this painfully unrewarding relationship. Aboard the plane, Maddie is relieved to find herself seated next to a passenger who shares her scorn for religion. After she confides her discomfort with her husband's unexpected turn, their conversation soon leads to a fascinating exploration of spirituality, God, and the quest for a meaningful connection. Maddie's skepticism softens under the perceptive insights of this stranger, who just happens to be the perfect stranger, Jesus, and she finds herself confronting the unspoken longings of her soul, her soul. As his comments touch on personal issues he couldn't possibly know about, she begins to wonder if she's misjudged not only her husband Nick, but also the God he now claims to believe in. It's a book about touching one's inner sanctum in ways that only God can do. And then, while I was in Canada, they sometimes have books laying around, and I just so happened to pick this one up. Don't let me know why. I brought it back. But anyway, <laughs> it's called The Miracle Life of Edgar Mint. And for some reason, I just picked it up and started reading it. It's a novel, and it says, with these words, Edgar Mint, half Apache and mostly orphan, makes his unshakable claim on our attention. In the course of Brad, Brady Udall's high-spirited, inexhaustibly inventive novel, Edgar Mint survives not just this bizarre accident, but a hellish boarding school for Native American orphans, a well-meaning but widely dysfunctional, devoutly religious foster family, and the loss of most illusions that are supposed to make life bearable. What persists is Edgar's innate goodness. <clears throat> In spite of all the stuff going on around him, his inner sanctum was basically always in a good manner. You know, sometimes you see people that are so good on the outside, but once you get to their inner sanctum, it's a dark place. Sometimes people may appear to be bad on the outside, but their inner sanctum is still good, you see? And Edgar was one of these people. His belief in the redeeming power of language and his determination to find and forgive the man who almost killed him. Apparently, when he was younger, he got ran over by a mailman. <laughs> it's head. And he survived. But he wants to find his mailman and say everything's cool. The Miracle Life of Edgar Mint is a miraculous story telling 
bursting with heartache and no hilarity and inhabited by characters as outsized as the landscape of the American West. This, again, it's in its own beautiful way, is an inner sanctum story about a person being changed in spite of all the things that are happening in his life. Great novel. So, and also, you know, it's all the things that we read that may impact our inner sanctum, including the scriptures and what we experience. Um, when we were in Canada, you know, sometimes uh, you have to be careful of the weather, okay? We had great weather, but storms come up unexpectedly, and I think we had two days of stormy afternoons. You, you don't want to mess with the storms in Canada. If you get stormy in Canada, you find a place to go and park your boat if you can't get back to the cabin. And I know on Thursday afternoon when I was fishing with Bill, Billy, uh, we had a storm come through and it was one of these uh, sh uh, storm shears. I mean, it was pretty brutal. And we just happened in the nick of time to find a little cove to park our boat. And that storm shear was within feet of our boat, but bypassing it totally. Isn't that amazing? Don't, I don't know, how, but again, by the grace of God, because we've been involved in a storm shear up there many years ago, and you don't want to get involved in a storm shear on a boat, okay, with a six horsepower motor. But again, I was praising God that we found this little cove. I mean, it was just in the nick of time and just enough to bypass our boat. And then uh, on Friday, Gary and I were fishing, uh, and... Um, a storm blew in, but it was not as bad as the one on Thursday. And we were parked in, in these rocks, and we were talking, and we were actually talking about, uh, you know, the whole concept of who's Lord of your life. You know, who's Lord of your inner sanctum? Right there in the midst of Canada, Gary and I are discussing this with this beautiful, uh, godly, you know, nature around us. I mean, it, it was just a fascinating concept of bringing the beauty of nature and the beauty of our souls together, talking about, you know, who's Lord of, of our lives, not externally, but internally. And I don't know if Gary saw it, but as I was looking out at the lake, there was actually a rainbow that started in the lake right in front of us and ended in the lake right in front of us. When was the last time you saw that? A rainbow couldn't be more than a hundred feet long, right in front of us. Talk about a sign from the Lord. I mean, just, this is what you need to look at in affecting the inner sanctum of your lives. Bring all this stuff together. And for the two days that I was fishing with Gary, uh, he brought me back to my fishing roots, which was trolling, okay? Again, now trolling is when you, you have your line behind a boat, and you have your bait on it, you know, and, and then the fish come and bite it. It's less active, but it's more relaxing, and, you know, you wait for the fish to come to you, you might say, okay? And that's what Gary likes to do. But over the years, maybe because of my way of doing things, I've become more of a caster, you know? I want to get up and cast into all these little bays. But Gary said, Eric, why don't you just relax for a while and enjoy the scenery? So for the two days that I was with Gary, I didn't hardly cast at all. I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that my hand was getting a little sore. Because, you know, we might cast five to 600 times a day. So, you know, that starts to add up. And I was worried about my job with Linda, whether or not my fingers would still work when I got back. So there was, you know, but it kind of brought me back to my fishing roots, you know, trolling. Why not troll more? And, cast a little less and bring the two together, affecting my inner fishing sanctum. And I brought that all together on Saturday with Teddy when we had that great, I mean on Sunday when we had that great 40 day. So it all kind of works together. We should be in a constant process of reflection, confession, repentance, and renewal. That's how our inner sanctum changes in the way that God sees fit so we can better ourselves not only for our own benefit and his benefit, but for the benefit of others as well. That's what the inner sanctum is all about. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians. 
He's basically talking with the fact to the Ephesians, you, you've all been blessed by God. You're all different people. Putting your differences aside. Don't let the external manifestations get in the way of what binds you together, which is your common search for that heavenly manner called Jesus that affects your inner sanctums. You all stand in need, hungry for what the Lord has to offer. Let that bind you together. Let that be which binds you together. Wow. What a different world it would be amongst us as believers if we didn't allow all the external stuff to get in the way. You know, the Saturday before I left for Canada, I was talking to a Lutheran pastor and we were really getting into some pretty inner sanctum type of conversation. And that's cool, you know. And all of a sudden he says, I don't believe in my baptism. Yeah, my physical birth to me is far more important than my baptism. Whoa, well, you know, I wrote my thesis, baptism, a call to discipleship. It's at the, it's at the heart of Lutheran theology. Well, you know, I could have easily tried to correct him right then and there, but I chose not to because we were on an inner sanctum conversation, which is far more important than me trying to correct him, maybe on his baptismal theology, which I don't think God really cares about, but maybe I do. You see what I'm talking about? So I brushed that aside, bit my tongue, and pursued our conversation about the inner sanctum of life itself. That's what Paul's talking about. And then, on the Monday that we were coming back from Canada, this past Monday, it suddenly dawned on me that as a pastor who's done over 400 weddings in his life, I forgot to mail in my daughter's wedding license. <laughs> which was actually due on the 27th, which is the day we were coming back, under penalty of law. How ironic it is, that, you know, with your own daughter's wedding, you would forget to do something like that. So one of the first things I did on Tuesday during my lunch break was run to the county clerk's office with her license, which I managed to get out of her house and bring it in. And they were all kind of giggling and laughing and said, well, that's OK. You're half a day late. We'll let you go. I don't think they really cared, but I didn't know any better. And then it realized on me that I put the wrong town that she got married in, which I've never done before. I put Streamwood down, which is where the reception was, instead of Wheaton, which is where the church was. So they all kind of looked at me because I, I filed it and then I, it suddenly dawned on me as I was walking out of the county clerk's building. Oh my God. So I ran back in. And they're all kind of looking at me saying, Streamwood's not in DuPage County. Don't you even know where your own daughter got married? <laughs> well, thank God I have a, a forgiving inner sanctum for myself or whatever. But you see what I'm talking about? So what you're going to get, Diana, is a a duplicate of the original that has wheat on it, but it's still okay. But how ironic it is that with my own daughter's wedding, I mess everything up. But that's part of the beauty of life. Please rise. Lord, we just know that uh, the beauty of who we are is what lies inside of us, not necessarily what we share on the outside sometimes and don't share. I'm not saying those things aren't important, but the inner sanctum uh, of your, uh, of our need for your heavenly manna uh, is what it's all about. Because we need to change from the inside out and not from the outside in. In the Son's name we pray. Amen.
just give you thanks uh, for not only filling our bellies, but giving us spiritual nourishment as well for our inner sanctums, providing that for us freely and openly in this country. Let's take advantage of it so that we can grow and become the people that you want us to be, your disciples. This time, if you feel the need to speak openly or just silently to yourself, uh, this is prayer time, so, uh, feel free to do so. Lord, I want to thank you for what you do in Ray and this, this miracle that's happening here. I just thank you, Lord, and I just um, am amazed. I just ask you to continue to do your healing in him. Lord, we ask uh, to be with uh, Cindy Steiger and her uh, health situation. Uh, watch over her, take care of her. Also be with Sharon uh, from Gathering North. Uh, watch over her for guidance and help. Also be with uh, Brenda and Deb who are traveling to uh, Mississippi uh, uh, for a family reunion. Watch over them as well. Father, I lift up Sharon and Deb to and continue to help her with dialysis and just help her with everything in her life that she she have a good piece of her life and it's not right. All these things we lift up to you in your most precious name. Amen. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Come forward to the usher's direction. In the 
this moment by the Spirit, Christ is with us. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you anew of his grace, truth, and love. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let's go to worship. Amen. 